Okay, so uh, it is 6.30, so um, bring this uh, meeting on January 25th, 2021 of the Eastern Conservation Commission to order. Uh, please note, uh, Charlie, I'm just gonna mute you. Say that again, Roy. I was gonna mute, mute you, but I can't. You want me to mute it? Yeah, there's just, we had some background noise there. Um, so uh, this is a remote meeting using uh, Zoom technology um, due to the state of emergency initiated March 12, 2021 by uh, Governor Baker in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting is being recorded both audio and video. Um, applicants uh, will be given the opportunity and ability to assume remote control over their hearings and make presentations uh, if necessary. Um, also, please note that on April 6, 2021, 2020, Commission delegated signature authority to Andrea Langhauser, Environmental Planner, Assistant Planning Director for all decisions issued during, uh, for the duration of the emergency. Um, so bookkeeping out, out of the way. Just um, <clears throat> before we started, I did want to address something. Um, I just wanted to take a moment uh, to address an issue for our meeting on January 11th. Um, during a presentation, Commissioner Malo, uh, he uttered a statement that contains, contains some profanity. Uh, Commissioner Malo believed he was muted and the utterance was not directed at anyone participating in the meeting. Um, on behalf of the Conservation Commission, I wish to apologize to anyone that heard the statement in question and was offended. Um, it certainly was not acceptable in, under any circumstances. So I just uh, wanted to clear the air there and uh, apologize to everyone for that uh, at, for our last meeting. Sorry, I didn't do it sooner. Okay, uh, moving forward here, um, just to note for the record, Tish, that uh, we are missing uh, Commissioner Lundeen. Um, so we were going to take uh, some out of order here, but... Um, I don't see uh, I don't see Collins here yet. So I was going to take the three septics since they seemed a little straightforward here um, first. But um, we'll go with uh, we'll go with the order, Andrea. So um, we have first up is uh, 181 Howard Street. This is a notice of intent to construct an in-ground pool, pool house, and patio. I promoted both um, Eric Diaz and his uh, client, Gary Ledeau. Excellent. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, for the record, Eric Diaz, registered professional engineer with Strong Point Engineering Solutions, here tonight representing Gary Ledoux um, for his project at 181 Howard Street. Um, if it is okay, I'll share my screen and just give a brief presentation and then we can turn it over to any questions. And I do have screen sharing power, so that is good. And everyone should be able to see that plan. Is that right? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so this is 181 Howard Street. It's an existing single family um, lot, about 40,000 square feet, just shy of an acre. Um, it is located within an ACEC, um, <clears throat> and the house was constructed, uh, we believe, back circa the 70s or so. Um, it certainly does the lot, um, the lot disturbances in the house predate the 1986 bylaw. Um, on the site, we've identified a bordering vegetated wetland that really wraps around three sides of the site, north, west, and south along the road, and ends right here at their driveway. Um, within that BBW, there's a culvert discharge uh, to what we are considering to be a tier three intermittent stream that we've identified as flags IB1 through IB11. Um, it, it, what you can see here, obviously, this dashed orange line is the 100 foot buffer zone. So essentially, mm -hmm. because we have BBW on all sides of this site, just about the entirety of the lot is within the BBW, uh, the BBW buffer. Um, and just as most of the lots within the 100, a good portion, I would say, just roughly estimating at least two thirds of the lot is within the 50 foot buffer zone disturbance. 
Um, so therein lies kind of what the crux of this notice of intent entails. Uh, what we're proposing is very simple, just a 40 by 15 in-ground pool in the backyard in areas that are already disturbed. I should mention that you can see through the tree line here that the lawn is disturbed all the way up to the limits of the BBW on the western side of the property from flags, let's say, A13 all the way to A19. Uh, there's really very lit little vegetation in that location. It's really all lawn area. So everything that we're proposing is staying in disturbed lawn areas. Uh, a 15 by 40 fiberglass in-ground pool. Uh, part of the reason we actually selected fiberglass is because the installation requirements are uh, a little bit more sensitive to work within a buffer zone. We don't have to bring in concrete trucks to pour uh, the pool and things like that. So install is a little bit easier. Uh, we're pro proposing a, a, excuse me, a pervious paver patio system. That's kind of hard to say on the fly, it turns out. Um, for the pool decking on all sides and for a 24 by 24 patio area off the back side of the garage that is being proposed. Uh, there is a proposed 12 by 12 pool house um, on the eastern side of the pool that is located primarily outside of the 50 foot buffer zone with the exception of maybe just this little tiny corner you can see where my cursor is here. Um, and then it, it, it is the last thing that we're proposing um, for physical improvements to the site is a six foot vinyl fence around the limits of the currently disturbed yard area. Uh, and that fence will have the gates that it needs on all sides for access and things like that. Um, the other thing that we're proposing by just for means of mitigation on this site is an invasive species management um, protocol. <laughs> throughout the area of the proposed work, which we understand we need to expand on a little bit. So the, the work being proposed is really very simple, straightforward, so to speak. I think the, the, at the center of this, however, lies the waiver requests. Um, just as most of the lawn, the, most of the disturbed lawn area is within the 50 foot buffer zone. So as the proposed work is in the disturbed lawn, er disturbed lawn areas and then therefore in the buffer zone. So we are requesting waivers for work within the 50 foot. Um, we have received the staff report. I'm sure Andrea will get into some detail, but I just wanna say, um, I don't see anything in there. That it's too painstaking for us. Um, there are certainly some plan improvements that need to be made. Um, she did ask that we expand upon our invasive species management plan, which we can do without a problem. We will get our wetland scientists to the site um, and develop some more detail on that. Um, and then I, I think a lot of the, the remainder of the comments are just based around sort of beefing up that waiver request to address the tenants in the bylaw, um, which we can certainly do and come back. Uh, but for the time being, we, we received that on Friday. We wanted to move forward with this meeting tonight, give an introduction, get the commission's comments. So that way we can compile one comprehensive response to comments and get it back before the commission as soon as possible. So I will stop rambling and turn it over to the chair. So I think that at the at the core of this request is whether or not and how much um, disturbance do we consider the installation of this pool and pool deck, um, as well as a patio, I guess, um, as in 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 comparison to the lawn that's there currently. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is this is a relatively flat. Um, um, site, um, so I'm, I'm not concerned about erosion, but I, I think the comparison of lawn versus installing a pool, um, that's the comparison that we have to, is at the core of what we're talking about here. And I being in, inside the, the 50 foot zone in an ACEC is really, um, I think that the crux of what we have to discuss and, and whether or not what, mitigation and, and whether or not it's equivalent to the disturbance that's happening and, and whether it makes uh, sense to do that. So um, sure. you know, whether, whether that can overcome the any sort of adverse effect that, that we may feel like um, could be occurring. So um, I mean, that's my initial thoughts um, on the project. Um, so anybody else have any thoughts?
I mean, I think this is uh, this is a lot better than a, an addition that's going to be potentially here. So I think it definitely provides a little bit more green initiatives with the pervious pavers. The fiberglass pool obviously is a good benefit. There's going to be no real problems because it's just going to be basically an insert. So environmentally sensitive ways of trying to do this work, I think that's more of a plus than any sort of addition or deck project that's going to create more future runoff. If I may, too, one thing that I, I should have mentioned is that the um, the pool will have a, a carbon cartridge filter on it, which is a, an alternative to some of the other um, more complicated um, versions of filtration that require discharge from the pool on a periodic basis and things like that. So this will remain self-contained, uh, just a matter of switching out the filter uh, rather than discharging backwash water and things like that. So again, you know, trying to, to stay with some of that, you know, we, we understand it's an environmentally sensitive area, especially within the 50 foot buffer zone. So things like that, uh, the pervious pa paver system to help mitigate runoff and, and kind of match the existing condition as much as we possibly can anyway, um, are all things that we really considered putting into this proposal. So, so I think the two, two things maybe um, to, to discuss here is, um, so the pool house is a 12 by 12 pool house. Yes. Um, is there any discussion of, of dealing with any sort of the roof run off, uh, off of the pool house? Um, you know, we haven't proposed it as of yet. Um, it, it's certainly something that we could, that we could entertain. Um, I think something like this, a 12 by 12 pool house, um, it, you know, methods to infiltrate roof runoff would probably equate to one or two uh, like standard call tech chamber or something of that nature. So I don't think it's anything that would necessarily be a deal breaker on a project like this. That's certainly something that we could talk about. And, and I think that the, the other thing would be um, containing any sort of runoff. Now, I, I know we're putting in pervious pavers, but is there any um, any concern of, of any sort of runoff from the decking, um, especially towards the, the, the north and the west here? Uh, that, that is the natural flow pattern of the land now. Everything does kind of sheet off in this direction, uh, obviously to the wetland, which is the low point. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be too concerned with additional runoff. I think a lot of the pervious patio systems that we have now um, certainly do a great job of getting the, the runoff back into the ground. Um, I wouldn't be worried about anything. You know, this isn't a let's say like a paved driveway or something that would have potential discharges from vehicles on it, stuff like that. This would be used only for, you know, manned recreation only. Okay. Anybody else have any comments? Eric, can you, can you zoom in at all on those plans? Yeah, absolutely. Where do you want to see? Uh, just maybe zooming in the whole thing for me i just can't really see it all too well how's that oh, that's per that's beautiful thank you if you could go just a little bit farther so you can um, read the uh, setback distances more clearly right in here how's that oh there you go yeah so we are and i i should have mentioned this too and this is mentioned in andrea's staff report too our closest disturbance to the edge of the pool deck is 15 feet off the edge of the um, BBW here at wetland flag A6. Uh, to the pool, we are approximately 25 feet from the pool to the wetland line between A15 and A16. And then our closest proposed disturbance is right here at this edge of the proposed paver, per, uh, I, I just can't say it tonight, the proposed <laughs> paver patio uh, which is 14.3 feet from wetland flag A14. Again, all within existing disturbed areas of the site. And Eric, real quick, so I'm just not very pool savvy. I know you were speaking about a cartridge, but what kind of um, filtration are we doing? Is this a salt pool or is this going to be like just chlorinated? Uh, this would be a chlorinated pool, I believe. Are they opposed to a salt option or? Uh, that's not something that I've discussed with my client. I know salt pools have, have very different maintenance requirements. Right. Um, you know, that's something that I can certainly discuss with them and, and get back to you on. Yeah, okay. we can, we'll review the specs on that. Uh, yeah, I believe that was Gary. Was that Gary? That was Gary, yep. Excellent. Yeah, so we'll take a look at the salt options and see if they give us any benefit in a case like this. Um, sure. 
and, and you know, see what we can make work. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Sure. Anything else from anyone? So I think that um, from, 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 from my, um, my standard here, I would say that um, they were a little short on the, the, the waiver requirements here, especially as we talk about um, public interest and, um, and no adverse effect. So I, th I think that, um, I think you're, you've started down that path um, I just think for the scale of the project, um, I'm not sure that invasive management covers everything, especially the amount of work that's being done that close to the wetlands. I and mean, we're talking 15 feet, 14 feet. So. Could I ask Mr. Chair, in a case like this, you know, obviously it's, it's a single family pool. It's a pool at a single family house. It's generally to the benefit of the homeowner. Um, in a case like this, is there any recommendations that you could make for the public welfare benefit uh, that we might be able to incorporate beyond just invasive species management or something like that? So I think that there's been a couple of times where there have been very limited opportunities on site to do um, um, public benefit. And I think that is a challenge for a single uh, family homeowner. Um, is how do you get that public benefit? Because most of the changes that would happen, as you said, actually, you know, benefit them as opposed to the public. Sure. You know, certainly enhancing the wetlands um, in the wetland buffer zone is a public benefit. It, it does enhance the, the value of the wetlands. Um, I'm just trying to keep scale sure. uh, of the project versus the, the enhancement Th that they've had to go off site. They've had to, to develop projects that were offsite. We had someone who did some um, trail maintenance at, w at one of the flyway, flyway pond uh, areas. He did some trail maintenance and that was in his neighborhood. So it was um, you know, something that, um, that the entire neighborhood benefited from, but it, that was uh, something that was offsite. We had someone else who um, uh, made a donation uh, that went towards our sign uh, fund where we're putting up new signs at all the conservation properties around town. I don't know if you've seen some of them. They're not that brown one anymore. They've gone to a, a green one I mean, or a gray one. So <clears throat> there's been some of those things. Um, those are just off the top of my head. I mean, there's probably been a couple of, uh, of other ones as well. But cool. similarly, um, I, I think at one time we may have proposed uh, doing some cleanup in one of our um, properties, but it turns out that we had someone else volunteer to do it before it even got to be a public benefit. But um, so these are the type of things that we've done in the past. Andrea, can you think of anything else that we might have done that was off site? Well, when 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 the applicant has the ability, land donation and conservation restrictions. Right. Okay. okay. All right. Well, I, um, I had a, did have a question about. There's a fence line along the pavers, but isn't there another fence line at the erosion control? Yeah, there is a fence line around the pavers here. That is a safety fence, a four foot, uh, presumably chain link safety fence with gates. Uh, but then around the erosion control at the limits of the lawn, we are proposing a six foot vinyl fence around the entire limits of the lawn. Uh, yeah. this I am. Um, I, I would just like to note to the commission, um, while there hasn't been a wildlife study here, this is the Hockamock Swamp ACEC. The land across the street is the Hockamock Swamp Wildlife Management Area owned by the state um, uh, wildlife authority. And um, six foot, there's this, this will absolutely, the, the fence line that he's proposing absolutely excludes um, the, resi the residential lawn area from any wildlife passage or use or anything. Um, so it, it's a real, uh, they're, they're making a very dramatic statement that they want all their residential backyard lawn area to be resi active residential backyard use. And um, that's, that's a, that is a policy question for you. Um, it's it's even if they're pervious pavers, it's that that fence line is 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 very permanent. 
Um, I noted that the alternatives analysis spoke to no alternative other than this. And so I think any guidance you could offer on um, size of pool, size of um, size of of um, impacted area would would be valuable. I I don't by just by you know just out there, uh, pervious pavers aren't pervious until until um, Eric shows us the the um, design detail and how it's going to be maintained. Um, I know he can do it, but it's it's it, I haven't I haven't seen it yet. Oh yeah, I mean I, I think he acknowledged that he needs to give us the details on the pervious papers. So yeah, but uh, the, the no alternatives analysis and the the uh, lack of a of a of a meaningful public interest um, makes it difficult for me to offer any kind of recommendation. And stormwater management isn't a maybe; it's a given. Um, even if even if it is a small area. Well, we can certainly look at the alternatives analysis and beef something up with that regard. Um, I will discuss what we can do for public benefit with my client um, and see what he's willing to commit to um, in order to get this done and come back with some ideas for the commission. Um, and as far as the stormwater management is concerned, we certainly have options for that pool house. Um, yeah, I mean, even as far as is putting it on sauna tubes and decking so there's no actual pervious area on the ground. Um, but we can certainly do something like that. Uh, we could certainly get some roof recharge um, and attach that in uh, to increase that. So we, we definitely have options. I think those are all matters that we can address and, and will address if provided that we can move this forward. I mean, I mean, I think that, you know, Andrea covers most of this in her staff report. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm not opposed and we've seen this at many um, um, homes where the, the, the sump is, the, the sump pump actually discharges into the, to the, um, into the wetlands, and, and that's certainly happening in this in this case as well. Um, I just, you know, um, I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just existing. It's 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 poor, it's more part of the, the sort of stormwater management. Um, I think also if there's some alternatives to, and I have no idea if the family owns a a pet that may need to be constrained in the backyard or not. Um, but you know, things about a fence installation where you're giving you know, some height above the ground that the bottom of the fence may be so you can have some, at least some mammal movement into the backyard, a small mammal movement. I mean, you'd keep out the coyotes, but you'd probably, you know, coyotes and deer probably wouldn't make it in there, but, you know, rabbits and other small animals and reptiles um, wouldn't be excluded from using the backyard. That might help with some of the wildlife habitat impact as well. I think that's something we can look at. I know that the um, the family, I don't know about pets, but I, I, my understanding is the family does have some young children um, and they have seen some wildlife in the yard as far as things like, you know, hearing coyotes at night, things like that. I think part of the idea is to keep those things out uh, for that reason. But if there's something that we can do that's less of a, a complete barrier that, like you said, will allow things like maybe moles or rabbits or something like that to run through there, that's something that we can take a look, like, a look at. Um, you might want to speak to Brad Holmes because he's been out to the site and he can probably offer some really good guidance. Sure. Yeah, just to give a heads up, Eric, uh, looks like Hockamuck has some, I don't know if it's turtles, but it says 741 for natural heritage. So, um, you know, potential six to eight inch gap in the fence from the, from the, from the floor would probably be sufficient enough. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Just making notes as we talk here. I think that's what Natural Heritage requests, requests anyway. Okay, that makes sense. Um, is that enough information right now? I mean, I think that you know, our goal would be to get you enough information so that um, you come back with a, a, an updated plan and, and um, you know an updated waiver request as well um, so that we can make a determination at our next meeting. I mean, so. Yeah, no, I think this is a uh, great information. It's a great start, kind of what we expected and what we were hoping for was to just get some feedback from the board and, and some, uh, some good guidance on where to go. And I think we have that. Uh, so certainly we have some things to discuss on our end. Um, be glad to go back to the drawing board and get back to you. Yeah, so I, 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 I one of the things I, I, I don't want, so, so this is, um, the, the, the information you should take away is that 
we're not fully opposed to putting a pool um, in this area, especially in pre-disturbed lawn that's already being actively used for recreation in, in the family's backyard. But there are some hurdles to overcome. So th that's really the mess. That's the bottom line drilled down message that you have to get to. Um, a pool is a little bit less, as, as I think John Thomas uh, pointed out, uh, less impactful of a development than putting on an addition. Sure. So um, I, I think that we would, you know, if you if you told me you wanted to put on a, you know, a, a 15 by 25 screened in porch, I'd say we might have a problem. Sure. Uh, so, but I, I think this is a little bit different and we've taken a little bit different approach to pools in the past, having a little bit less impact than um, a structure. But um, at the same time, we, we have to be cognizant that you are as, you know, I pointed out many times tonight, the Hockamock ACEC, you're inside the no disturb zone. Um, and it's called the no disturb zone for a reason. So we, we have some hurdles to overcome. Sure, uh, we understand that, but we certainly appreciate the feedback and the board, uh, the commission's willingness to work with us on this. So thank you. Okay, great. Excellent. Any other questions? Andrea, any other comments? Only that the abutters were notified um, on this case and all other cases prior to uh, start of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us. We sort of take that as a, a given these days, but it, we do have to make sure that happens. Um, so uh, any other commission comments before I, I put it open to public comment? Okay, so any public comment for 181 Howard Street? You can uh, raise your hand or Okay, so seeing none, um, I am, so we need to continue this. Eric, Mr. Ledoux, do you have a preference? February 8th is our next one. The one after that is February 22nd. I think we've got a good amount of work to do and we certainly wanna give everybody time to, to digest it before we come back. So I would recommend we go for the 22nd uh, just to give us the time to coordinate things on our end rather than try to rush things in because within the next week or so. So do, just for my own edification, what's the meeting for? What's the meeting after February twenty second, Andrea? Do you know? March fifth. Okay, so February twenty second. No, no, it's the uh, it's the eighth. March eighth. Eighth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we'll go for the twenty second. Uh, I think twenty second makes sense. Okay. So uh, make a motion to continue 181 Howard Street to uh, February 22nd. Spade a second. A roll call vote, call fells aye. Hey, low aye. Spade aye. Thomas, aye. Okay, so we'll see you all in a, in a couple of meetings. All right, guys, thank you very much for your time. We'll uh, get back to you shortly. Yes, Thanks thank you for your time, appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, so um, next up is 52 Turnpike Street. Okay, this is a notice of intent to repair uh, and upgrade an existing residential septic system. And as Andrea pointed out, we do have uh, the butters were notified and we do have a DEP number on this one. And we have Peter Lyons from Collins Engineering. How are we doing guys? Here. <laughs> Um, I missed you a little bit. What are we on? Turnpike Street? 52 Turnpike. All right. Um, if I could share my screen, I'll pop that plan up. Bear with me one second. Doesn't like to cooperate when I get a bunch of drawings open. Let me try to shut a few down. It's paused and it won't let me resume. Does anyone have any input on why? No. No. It says you've started to sh stream 
from our end, it says that you've started the uh, screen sharing. So I just stopped, I just forced stopped it, Peter. So I don't know if you want to try and give it another shot. Hey, I wonder why it's not cooperating tonight. So Peter, these, these are pretty straightforward. I hope you don't mind me in the interest of uh, expediency. Yeah, well, however you guys want to handle it, sorry. Um, I will uh, I will go from here. Um, you have to stop uh, sharing your screen. I, I, I can force him to stop. So. Okay, there you go. Okay, so this is 52 Turnpike. I will try and... I don't have the fancy screen like Peter, but apparently it's no good tonight, anyways. All right, dude, I can see that fine. Do you want me to just give a quick rundown of what's going on? You go for it, yeah. Sure. Um, as you can see right away, not an ideal situation here. Um, this is a septic repair on an existing three bedroom home on Turnpike Street. It's. Um, it's a 8,000 square foot lot requiring about a 2,000 square foot leaching area. Um, the, the southerly lot line is actually within our erosion control limits. Um, we're looking to access the site through the abutting property. Um, it's really the only way in there. Yeah. Overview of the site on the top right or the northeast corner of the lot, we have a BVW. And right off of that is our proposed erosion control. And you get right into some, um, uh, our leaching configuration. Um, we meet the minimum setbacks to the existing house being 10 feet to the pond, to the tanks and 20 feet to the field. And uh, based on the sieve analysis results, we had a very poor loading rate, which in turn makes the, the leaching uh, requirements a lot more significant. So there's high groundwater out here and also very poor soils. So we end up with a leaching footprint, you know, double the size of the house. Um, this one, we might be going back to the drawing board on, so I'm just kind of looking for the commission's uh, first field, but we might be revising this uh, to make it slightly more compliant and um, gain some separation to the BBW. So uh, basically at this point tonight, I'm just looking to make my presentation uh, with the intent of continuing the hearing to the next meeting. And we may or may not be making some changes. Um, so as always, we've got our erosion control proposed around the entire project and conservation posts being shown in three locations along the rear lot line. Um, <clears throat> any other specific questions? I'll, I'll take them at this time, I guess. So can you give us some perspective on the proposed uh, retaining wall at this point? I mean, in, in, the, in the south, in the north east corner, it's going to be about four feet high. Uh, yeah, that's that's correct. So the grade, let's call it eighty-three feet, and the proposed grade over the system is eighty-eight. So it's five feet to the top of the field, but the um, the wall is about a foot lower than that. So you're you're looking at about a four foot wall at the high point, and then less as you make it back towards the house. And it's the same along the the um, along the e the entire eastern side of that as well. It sort of tapers back up to where the yep uh, eighty six point five. So where the wall ends at the at the southeast limit of the wall. That's that's a, a foot above existing grade right. as shown there. It's a foot above existing grade. Where? Uh, where you go from the 85, there? yeah, right there, yeah. Okay, right in there. 
and then it's 80, and then it, it, it extends up to here, which is zero, but it's about four feet here. Correct. Yeah, but it's about four feet at the wetland side. And uh, we're proposing the two by two by four concrete blocks. So that'll be a, a vertical stack, um, you know, four feet. If it's any bigger, usually we'll step them. Um, two blocks on top of each other isn't too big of a deal. And obviously we're trying to maximize the distance to the wetlands. So, so it, it, the house side, how are you, um, if, if the field is gonna be 80, what's the top of the field, 88? Top of the field is 88, yep. So uh, existing grade at the back of the house is about 86, maybe 86.5 on the southern corner. So the house is um, only about two feet lower. And then um, the grading will kind of be swelled to prevent any water from really coming back at the house. We'll have a little bit of grading over the proposed tanks, um, but everything's basically gonna go to the north and around the retaining wall, and then ultimately down towards the wetland. And um, same thing on the on the southern portion. It's almost going to ride around the dashed line, um, being the liner of the system, <clears throat> and then that ties into a swaled area at the eighty six contour, at the southeastern extent of the property. So uh, all the all the flow ultimately is you know being redirected towards the wetlands, um, off and around the leaching system. So you, your your intention is to to modify this plan. Can you give us some sense of what what those modifications might be at this time? To modify what was that? I'm sorry. Modify this plan. Um. Well, we took we two took two series of um, soil samples, and one came back a lot more favorable than the other. So the way that works, we're we're required to design off of the the most poor rate. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we're looking at maybe utilizing a different layer of soil or spinning the system, um, you know, if we could get different test piss results, you know, to hopefully shrink it down a little bit. Um, no, I was just made note of the, the continuance uh, prior, just prior to the meeting. So unfortunately, I don't have an, an alternative uh, analysis at this time. Um, as you can see, this is pretty much as bad as it gets. So I think any alternatives we come up with would, would only be an improvement. Uh, it's just a really tight, you know, not a great situation out here. So um, it is a system in failure. You know, we're, we're just looking to get it cleaned up. Um, it is what it is. It's kind of what these ones come down to. So uh, if the commission has any recommendations, you know, we'd be happy to, to hear them out. But um, the con, we're getting quotes, you know, up around fifty to sixty thousand dollars for for this repair as it is. Um, so you know, we're just kind of looking into other options at this time. Because there's other options, um, and we don't usually expect that the engineer hasn't um, exhausted them all. I can't really say that it's compliant with the uh, simplified system uh, policy <coughs> until he un until he examines all all alternatives and comes up with the least impactful. Hey, anybody else have any questions? No, I agree with Andrea what she just said. It's the onus of the applicant to do that. Yep, they they seem to they seem to uh, be taking that so. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll deal with that at our next meeting. Anybody else? Any questions? All set, Rory. Any, uh, any public comment for 52 Turnpike Street? What is the perk rate there? What is the perk rate? Yeah. Um, so as mentioned, uh, if, if, Rory, maybe we can scroll over to the, the test pit logs. Uh, what we encountered here was um, 
just what we encountered was about five five and a half feet of um, poor materials and then we get into what we call the sandy loam so we actually took a sieve analysis from the the sea layer um down a little deeper so we're looking at a, a four foot removal and we don't really get a perk rate but we get a, a design loading rate mm -hmm. which um is is uh, 0.15 so that's roughly four times the size of you know what you'd be building if it were um, a sandy soil out there you know, the reason I asked, it look, just looks like the system's a little bit large for the size of the, uh, what was it, three-bedroom house? Yep. I mean, it, it all comes down to the soil results. Unfortunately, yeah, it's only a three-bedroom, but it's it's huge. Um, that's based on the title, you know, the state Title V regulations, um, based on the sieve analysis results to determine an appropriate loading rate in place of a park test. Um, so yeah, this is all witnessed and verified by the board of health. So ultimately, um, it's a mutual agreement on the sizing for the system. Is there any reason you didn't do it? Uh, didn't take a perk rate? Uh, yes, we had a water table was above the material we were trying to test. So the perk rate would have been um, saturated materials. There was water weeping into the hole. So um, that's kind of a standard practice if either the hole's wet or it's an unsafe condition yeah. to perform the perk test. Yeah, I mean, you could do a dewater, but then you'd end up with a mounted system and a whole bunch more expense. Uh, yeah, and, and well, yeah, it's gonna be a mounted system ultimately anyways, but um, no, I, Dewatering in, in poor soils like this, you know, we wouldn't have very optimistic results. Even if you dewatered it, uh, the soil is still so saturated, it's, right. it's probably not going to really work. So, okay. Anything else, Charlie? No, that's it. Okay. So, uh, Peter, we, we just gonna, we're going to continue to 2A? Yes, I'd like to continue, please. So, uh, making a make a motion to continue 52 Turnpike to February 8th. Thomas, Next. second. Thomas was a second. Uh, roll call vote. Call fells aye. Nay, low aye. Spady aye. Thomas aye. Okay, so we're going to move on to 479 Bay Road. This is a notice of intent to repair uh, an existing residential septic system. I, I can, why don't you just give us a little bit of the overview and then I can move around to where we need to move on. To. Um, all right, I can. I was waiting for you to put the plan up, but I can pull it up. I don't, I don't have it up? No, I just see you, I think. Hang on. All right. 479 Bay Road. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so this, this is an 11 room um, house septic repair on the western edge of Bay Road. Um, we have BVW to the, the southern um, property line as well as an existing stream shown uh, with mean high flags. The 100 foot buffer cuts through the middle of the existing home and the 200 foot buffer cuts through to the north. Um, basically through the site I'm just kind of having a tough time seeing the blue lines and I'm sure everyone else is too, but the 200 foot buffer cuts through the far edge of the system. So uh, what we're doing here is taking the existing plumbing, which is located at the back of the house and we're rerouting it to a thousand to a 2000 gallon septic tank and a thousand gallon pump chamber. And then um, high ground water out here as with most of Bay road, so we're pumping it to an elevated leaching bed, um, a 28 by 49 bed with um, plastic quick pour chambers. 
The project will include um, taking down some trees for the leaching and regrading that area. Um, we've proposed dewatering locations and soil stockpile areas uh, between the proposed leaching and the existing garage. We're also contending with an irrigation well on site. Um, the tanks are as close as 50 feet to WF2. And as mentioned, the leaching is um, probably 180 feet from the stream. Uh, we have erosion control wrapping around the entire project, uh, which has been staked out in the field. So the erosion control starts at the existing gravel driveway and wraps around the tank installation and the um, clearing and the construction of the leaching area. We have proposed a series of conservation posts down gradient from the project, um, pretty much at the existing tree line um, at the front. And then as it goes back, they cut out into the yard a little bit following uh, an offset from the border and vegetated wetland flags. Um, those marker locations are staked out in the field as well. So the contractor knows where they need to be. Um, that's, that's about my presentation, I guess uh, if they, Commission has any questions at this time? I'll take them. No, just uh, from the commission standpoint, um, this is the Mulberry Brook, is that right? Uh, yes, yeah, we have it labeled Mulberry Brook Conservation Area on the back, so I think that makes sense. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, um, you know, an active stream for sure, so. It, uh, yes. It, it runs even in the driest parts of the, the year, so. Um, any other questions from the commission? I mean, I, I'm not quite sure where else in this property they would do this. So. Yeah, I don't see any other alternatives for location based on the aerial. Yeah, that's a tough one. I just want to note that this isn't the Mulberry Brook itself. This is a tributary that's coming off of Sawmill Pond. We have in the past had um, some localized flooding off of um, the sawmill pond trip. This is this is where the water is supposed to run, and it tends to get diverted. So this is this is known as a flood zone area, but to an un unknown uh, elevation. So um, those permanent markers are actually important because. Um, the stream overtops its bank regularly. Oh yeah, I, I, I've definitely seen it all the way out here. You know, yeah. It, it definitely, it goes out to the edge of the wetlands. There's no question about it. And that's just on a regular day. That's not during a storm. Yeah, so I, yeah, I've definitely seen it out there. Um, okay, any other comments? Um, any public comment for 479 Bay Road? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Peter, I assume you want to close? Yes, please. So um, I make a motion to um, close the hearing, issue a permit, of work, permit for work and order conditions for 479 Bay Road. Uh, noting um, in the staff report, uh, no dumping in the wetlands is a perpetual condition. Second. Uh, roll call vote, Kalfels, aye. Melo, aye. Spady, aye. Thomas, aye. And Tish, that was just Melo on the second. And the commission is aware that the DEP file number came in today. Yes, the DEP number, sorry, DEP number 1521673. Um, the, the next one is um, 46 Depot Street. This is another notice of intent for uh, 
septic uh, repair upgrade. Um, Peter, just note that we don't have a DEP on this. Okay. So, so we'll go through everything, but uh, um, we'll, we'll have to continue this at the end of the day. And let me see what I can do here. All right, that looks pretty good. Um, let me take over. Go for it, yeah. Sure. So this is another septic repair on a, on a failed system, an existing three-bedroom home on the, <clears throat> call it the eastern side of the property. Uh, we have some drainage going on underground, which leads to a screen in the southeastern corner of the property. Um, we show 50 foot, what are all the lines? 50 foot and 100 foot buffers. Um, I think I'm just missing something on the bottom of your plan. Yeah, so the, there's a BVW line that breaks off from the stream. So we have a couple buffers going on on the plan. Uh, the blue is the 100 foot inner riparian limit. And then the purple is uh, the end of the BVW limit, um, 100 foot offset. So with this one, it's another real tight site. Um, nowhere to go out in the front by the time we meet our setbacks, there's nowhere to put it in the front yard. So really what we're doing is shoving it off to the, the back right corner of the property, which is basically our maximum um, distance from the wetlands and still being able to maintain the required Title V separations through the structure. So uh, what we're proposing is just a 1,500-gallon septic tank in a gravity system to a reasonably sized 14 by 25 leaching bed. Um, I'm not going to say there's no grade changes, but we'll call it very minimal. Uh, your 94 contour is just being stretched out towards the southern edge of the leaching field um, to accommodate the, the required cover over the leaching chambers themselves. Um, looks like there will be one tree coming down near test pit one as shown on the plan. The rest of the area is existing lawn um, to be loam and seeded after construction. <coughs> We've provided erosion control encompassing all of the leaking components as well as our stockpiling areas and dewatering pit uh, locations as shown on the plan. The erosion control starts at the garage and wraps around the project, ending back up at the Depot Street property line at the, the 93.7 spot grade you see on the plan. Um, that's it. This one's pretty straightforward uh, as far as a septic project goes. Um, unfortunately, we are still contending with the wetlands. So this is our most practicable solution for uh, everything we have going. So I'll take any questions at this point. Where's the existing system? Um, it, it looks like straight out the back of the house. Right here. There's um yeah, it looks like a single maybe a a pit and then a leaching trench or something just beyond that, those yeah. gas lines. And um, you know, those as we've discussed before, a lot of these locations are kind of approximate, so they may or may not encounter them when doing the system. Yeah. Um obviously we we anticipate encountering them, so we to note on the plan, you know, tanks to be pumped and filled, and then typically the existing leaching, if it's not encountered, is left in place. And um, any old components that are encountered in the overdig would be removed and replaced with a clean fill and um, properly disposed of offsite. So that's about it. Um, conservation posts around the existing tree line. We got four of them. Um, What's the top elevation of the of the field? Uh, ninety four. Yeah, so we're we're talking. It's only a, a foot or two. At, at the uh, back side. Yeah, not even. You'll be coming up about six inches at the back of the field. Yep. Okay. 
Um, anybody have any comments? Okay, any, uh, any public comment for 46 Depot? Uh, seeing none, um, we need to continue this to February 8th, Peter, just because of, uh, of the no DP number, so. Okay, now in the past, I, I thought we have um, conditionally had them approved pending the DEP number comes in. I mean, is that an option if, if you guys are all right with the plan itself? The, the problem with doing that, Peter, is that if um, DEP hadn't gotten it for some reason, um, if they ask for anything, any information, we can't take it into consideration because the hearing's already closed. Okay. So 21 day, we have 21 days after the hearing is closed. And if you run into a problem with DEP, it, our time gets eaten up. Sure. Okay. I mean, yeah, we don't anticipate any issues, but uh, if that's the way the process has to work, then we'll, we'll continue it. It's, it's, it's the safest one, Peter, I think at this point. So, okay. So a uh, motion to continue 46 Depot Street to February 8th. Thomas said it. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. That's cool, dude, you got it. <laughs> so Thomas had the second roll call vote. Caulfield's aye. Milo aye. Spady aye. Thomas aye. Okay, Peter, appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys. That's all I got for you tonight. Okay, we'll see you next time. See ya, take care. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, next up is a continued hearing from 34 Roundtable Road. Um, this is a notice of intent for um, an in-ground pool with associated uh, apron and filter system. I think there's also some after the fact approvals being requested for some other um, work that's been done on the property over the last uh, many years uh, that were not permitted. So. So uh, Ken Thompson is a representative. Good evening. Hi, Ken. Good. My name's Ken Thompson. Yes, there's a lot of things to discuss. <laughs> so can I have control of the stream? Sure. Thanks. All right, here's our property. I'm going to zoom in so everybody can see it. I've, I've overlaid all the different resource lines. The yellow is the 100 foot buffer for the riverfront. Uh, second yellow is the 100 to 200. This light blue one in here. Just, just one second, Ken. We don't uh, we don't have your screen here, so. Oh, okay. Um, At the I, bottom, did you hit share screen? Oh no, no, that's me again. All right. There you go. All right. It's not the one I wanted, but that's close enough. This is a hard copy of what I was trying to show you. So wetland line here. The brook is back here, perennial brook. I'm never going to get the name right on that. So this is the first 100, 200 Aquanicate. foot. Aquanica. Aquanica. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> um. 50 foot wetland, 100 foot wetland buffer, uh, floodplain, 100 foot buffer. I have different uh, images of the different years. And I went back and looked at MassGIS. 2001 shows the lawn cleared out into here, down here. And then it gets a little tighter up in here. There's been something going on up in this area. I have a 2013 image that shows that somebody was in there cutting things do you want me to bring them up yeah i think so okay cool um can you see that one uh, no no do i do i have to sh shut down what i'm sharing to start again i think the probably the way you have it set up you have them in different windows i do so. i do have them why don't i go back to the Carlson because then i can just change the layer 
There you go. All right, here we go. This is the 2001. I'm going to have to zoom out for you to see it. But what I'm trying to show you here is that the yard was cleared back in the original. Um, originally done. Now, the house was built in 93. This is the 2001. See this tree buffer here between the, the house to the south? Yeah. And that's lawn. You can follow some of the shadows. I know the image is terrible. But it's but it's the 2001. Let me do something here. Let me try something here for you guys. There it is. Bring it up front. So this is our property here. But now you can see I've pushed everything to the back. But you can see the lawn area was created and then it comes around up through this area here. Does that make sense? Sure, yep. Okay, let's go to 2013. I'm just trying to get the history of where this was cleared to is my general um, approach to this. What has happened to this property? On the 13, I gotta zoom back out, move it to the back again, sorry. Uh, darn order. All right. See this area in here? This has been cleared in 2013. Here's the trees. This is just, you got to be careful of those shadows. Yeah. This is all on in here. These three trees since 2013 have been removed. My clients bought the house in 2016. They say they know nothing about it. Andrew. Andrea, I think this is the line in which we found that stuff stacked in the wetland. Mm -hmm. Remember any stumps in there, big stumps or anything? Yeah, there was a lot of leaf litter, Ken. Leaf litter, yard stuff, right? Okay. Yeah. So somebody came in and moved three pine trees out. Okay. So now we'll get back to the 2019 image. Get rid of this. And we have all kinds of things going on. This young couple buys a house, first house, three. They have two young children. And they went to work in their yard. So within the 50-foot buffer, now I've moved things around. This is a different plan than, than what was submitted. The pool's been moved outside the 100-foot. This small shed, which will act as a pool house, has also been moved out. I have left a large one there. The reason for that, it's 24 by 12 feet. To take that apart and move it. The only way you're going to do it is you're going to have to cut it apart. You know, I don't know if it came in on a trailer and they just put the walls up and screwed it all together. We have a deck that's different, but I didn't show you in the 2013, there was another unpermitted deck right here off the end of the house. Okay. I can flip back and show you that. You guys are concerned about the dog pen, which is right in that area. There's a fire pit, paver patio, and picnic bench. And this is that AstroTurf play area. So what we're recommending is that we uh, remove, we'll, we'll pull these out. We're gonna, we're requesting by waiver the deck. I'd like to leave the large shed there because I don't know how to do anything to it. We'll add gutters and a, a, a dry well infiltrator for, for the uh, runoff off that roof. We're requesting that the fence stays up. And on the sides, they have that white vinyl fence, but on the back, they have that four foot aluminum fence. And I think the spindles or whatever you want to call them, pickets, they're about four to six inches apart. I don't know what safety protocol is on those. I remember leaning on it. I don't know how wide they are. I don't know how high off the ground it is, but I mean, I could see rabbits getting through it. I could see animals getting through it, deer jumping over it. So the, the, the fence in the back is a chain link fence, isn't it? No, no, it is not. It's an aluminum fence. It is? Yep. I'll get a picture oh. of it. I'm, I'm not anticipating closing tonight. Hey, no, no, it's okay. I just want to make sure we have all the facts. Well, I'm going to have to get a final stamp plan together, have the survey prepare sign a uh, final stamp plan. So I'm assuming we're going to talk about all these different details. 
and hopefully come up with something that works for, for you guys. Hey, Andrea, do you remember when the first hearing of this was? The first hearing was on um, December 7th. So there's there's a there's a chain link fence behind the the shorter um, little fence that's the the picket fence. There's a chain link fence all along the back part of the property. I thought this end up here near the gate was that aluminum stuff. Maybe I'm mistaken. It's a memory recall for me. I didn't take a lot of pictures there. I took them down by the river. Yeah, that, that's all. It's all chain link. Okay, so we're going to have to raise it up. Well, I think that's something for us to talk about, right? I mean, one of the things we have to talk about here is wildlife habitat and wildlife impact. And Well, the reason they threw the fence up is because of the coyotes were in the yard. That's a pretty big wildlife area behind them. Yeah. And like I said, they got two, two young kids, three and five. I think it was a need, you know, a reaction to it, you know. So we'd like to have some form of safety there. I don't mind having them move the fence up four inches, six inches, similar to solar panels, you know, large solar camps, you know. It's not unheard, unheard of. That would allow the small mammals. We're just trying to keep that coming through the bushes, sitting in behind, behind bushes and ambushing, you know. They do have pets and they do have children. Yep. Understood. I mean, I, I think that, you know, that's that's got to be part of your, your wildlife, you know, habitat analysis here is, is what can we do to, to, to not disturb the, the habitat, um, you know, as much as possible, I think. You know, I, I think these large predator um, mammals um, is a bit of a challenge uh, for homeowners, you know. Um, yeah. you know we, we can talk about them as conservationists, but um, it's a little bit of a challenge when they're 50 feet from your back of your house. Right. It's I, I think coyotes is more ambush coming out of the bushes fast, you know. I don't think you're gonna I bet you they could jump over a four foot fence. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. I mean they're 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 gonna be less likely to attack children, you know, to get over a fence. So they're not that much of an ambush predator, but well. <laughs> Speaking of ambush, um, what did you say about the dog relocate, dog fence relocate? Yeah, we're going to move all that up into this area up here. Get it out of your way. Get rid of all this stuff. And then I was proposing to mitigate some naturalized plantings in there, the, the blueberry bushes, red raspberry, all these natural edibles, you know, natural native plants that are edible. Combination of birds and people, you know. But I was calculating, this is just to describe why it's so large. That's eight feet off the fence on the inside. And it accounts for the square footage of the shed, the deck, and this portion right here of the pool, right up in here. And this will be a saltwater cartridge pool. So it comes to like 1,420 feet. And I think I got 1,440 there and then throw down natural chips around them, you know? Um, so, uh, Andrea, um, just remind me what we're, we're, we're working with here. We're in an, are we in an ACEC here? You're Yes, yeah, we are. we're in the Canoe River and AC Canoe River, and this is the the Pequonica is a uh, perennial stream, so it really is a two hundred foot um, riverfront area. It pre disturbed acknowledges um, that you can allow structures by the state regulations as long as you have a 
you improve existing conditions on a one-for-one -one ratio, which is um, why Ken was spouting his the math. It is um, it's the fifty it's the fifty foot it's within the the, ex, the existing dog area, um, active play area and shed are within the 50 foot of the buffer zone. And again, it's high quality um, buffer given it's given it's the ACEC is for is for the public drinking water, not just of Easton, but five other municipalities are using that sole source aquifer. So I think that the Ken is, Ken is proposing to remove all but the shed from the 50 foot buffer zone it might, and the fence. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that correct, Ken? Yeah, that's correct. So, so, so go ahead, Andrea. You just note that um, there might be some mature trees coming down in order to replant native edibles adjacent no, to. No trees are coming down. Oh, good. Okay, good. No, I wouldn't cut a tree down. Just go shade underneath the tree. Okay. Native shades, you know. Okay, good. A wildflower, whatever that snake root thing is. It's really pretty. The white one that curls its tail. I'm doing a meadow up in Dedham. So, um, so here, here's here's the the challenge for us, Ken. Right, and and I, and, and I'm not. Your applicant is having to pay for the sins of others, right? Um, some of them. I, not, yeah. not all, some some are their own, but but some are some are the sins of others, right? I mean, we've expanded this deck, we've we've uh, put in this shed, we've taken down trees, we've disturbed it uh, with putting in fencing and all this other stuff. So that, it's a bit of a challenge for the applicant, right? And I mean, I mean, yeah. I appreciate that that you know they've come to us and and said, okay. Let's fix this. Let's do what we need to do. Um, you know, they understand that having to remove the the um, the dog area and the play area out, outside of that buffer zone, um, the shed. They're asking for some um, um, some consideration, especially if we uh, deal with the the runoff of the stormwater. Um, I'm just trying to summarize all this and, and just you know sort of get this. I mean. You know, the, dealing with the, the pool um, in the riverfront um, is really the only thing they have. To, and I, don't, I mean only because there's so much going on on this site, um, you know, having to deal with the, the outer 100 in the, the riverfront um, uh, area um, for the pool. But you've moved it out of all the other buffer zones. So yeah, I'd, I'd have to, if to get it out of the riverfront, I'd, I don't yeah. know, the offset's like 20 feet off the property. I'd have to take down a bunch of trees there. Right. You know, this is still in the lawn area. Yeah, well, I, I, think, that, I think that goes into our, our, our alternatives analysis, right? I mean, one of the things with the waiver is we have to know what the alternatives were. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that you've weighed that saying, listen, I've put it where I think it's less disruptive in being 500 square feet in the riverfront than it is to take down all these trees. So, um, so, so I think that that's an alternative and that's a choice that we can make as a commission to say, listen, we believe this alternative is better than taking down all the trees. So I think it's important for maybe some narrative around sure. that in the waiver um, to say what other, so we know there was one that was in the backyard, which we've taken off the, the, the plate here. You're saying that to get it all the way outside the riverfront area, it would it, you know, necessitate taking down you know, 10 trees or whatever it is, and those are mature trees. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that that has to go into the alternatives analysis because you need to build this waiver to make it, you know, convincing to us that this is an appropriate um, um, uh, project that can be approved. So, um, so I, I think that the the homeowner and you have done a good job of giving back some things to 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 you know some of the things that were previously done to disturbed area, mitigating it, plantings, um, putting some um, um, some materials there that would you know, facilitate turning that to its wetland state. Um, I think that's important. Um, this is, you know, I mean, that that is, as Andrea says, that's a perennial stream in the Canoe River Aquifer. So, um, you know, it really means a lot to, to, the, um, to, the, to the public. So, um, so I, I think that I have a sense of what the project 
is meant to encumber the, the meant to cover. So I, I think that we've we just have to get to the point of, you know, can we meet the waiver requirements? Can we allow for leaving the shed in the in the 50 foot buffer zone? How do we um, adjust the fence to allow for um, um, uh, some uh, wildlife travel? And but you know, sort of protect it from you know uh, other mammals that may be um, more dangerous. So, um, and then of course the you know, and I think here from your public interest standpoint. Um, you know, we had the same conversation earlier. Um, I, I just have to be a little bit careful about trying to understand the, the public interest on this. Um, certainly restoring the wetlands that were disturbed, I'm not quite sure is a public interest um, because that, that's what has to get done um, for part of the project. So anybody else have any comments? John, I'd be interested to hear from you on this. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, basically you're paying for the sins of the previous owner. You see this quite a bit, um, you know, certain activities occurred and you just have to, when you want to do work, it's kind of like, it's a shock of what actually was done on the property without a permit. So after action filings are never an easy, easy way to go about doing things. And yeah, it's a kind of a sad situation for this one, but yep, yeah, I'm glad to see that this area is going to be restored back to its, uh, back to a better state. Charlie or Mike? Um, I'm all set. Same, I'm not. So I'm just checking basic examples in agreement with John. So, so to give the applicant um, some direction here, because, you know, this is their second iteration in front of us. I, I think that they heard us the first time and, and have come back with a plan that at least is something for us to work for. Do we, do we given, do we think in general, we, we wanna move forward with this project with them or do we think that this is just not an approvable project? I mean, I'd like to see kind of what their plan is for restoration and mitigation. And then like, it's a two phase project, you know, we'll fix, fix up the property first, uh, get it back into good standing and compliance, and then, um, then look at it from another standpoint of seeing how this is going to work for uh, the proposition of a pool and um, that kind of project. That's my thoughts. I like what you said, John. I, I agree with that. That sounds like the best way to go about it. So, so when, when we look at this, I mean, they're coming in with a single NOI on this. Do, do, we, do we look at it from, okay, let's look at it from here's, here's a here's the restoration and mitigation that's gone on from the, the stuff that happened before the, the uh, before they want to do the pool. Let's get that settled, right? And then we look at the pool afterwards as sort of a second phase of this project, not as a separate second permit, but as a second phase. Well, you can condition it that all the restoration is done first to your approval. Yeah, I'm, I'm just talking theoretically as we look at it and talking sort of to, to John and Mike and, and Charlie here, so. Yeah, I mean, that makes, basically in my opinion. I think that makes good sense, Roy. John? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's sad for the owners who didn't even do this, but at the same point, you know, it's their property now and they inherit all the, um, they take ownership of um, all the work that's been done on the property. That's just the way it goes. And you know, for them to, I, it looks like they're willing to do the work, um, but I'd like to see it done uh, in accordance with you know mitigation procedures, and then hopefully um, you know see what the follow through is going to be with the other section of it. Okay, yeah, and, and I'm not I'm not asking anyone to commit to approve this project. I, I'm simply sort of taking a temperature check here. Do we have the appetite to approach this project? beyond the mitigation i mean i think the mitigation is we're obviously all in favor of that but are, do we do we have an appetite to continue with the project of the pool um on top of the the, the restoration and mitigation i mean the fact that it, they're moving the pool outside of the other buffer zones and putting it to the most extent practical on the fringe of the riverfront area i think that is an acceptable use it's also going to be within existing lawn so no other no other additional vegetation is going to be disturbed as part of this project. So I think it, 
it kind of hits all the check boxes for trying to meet it to the extent most practical. Okay, I, I agree with that. So I just I want to sort of get I, I want Ken to understand and his, his and his client to understand before they put another few thousand dollars into engineering on this, um, you know what they can expect down the road. So I'm I'm just you know if if we're if we're a no go on this right now, I want them to know that. You know I I don't think we are. Mm -hmm. No, we're definitely not no-go. But can we still complete it underneath one notice for intent? Yes. Okay. That'd be fine. I, I think so. You just, I, I think just, I, and I think that um, you guys have come forward with, um, um, you know, an, an open um, uh, uh, approach to this. Um, taking our feedback, you uh, really uh, are presenting, this is what we need to do and we're going to do it. I think when you come to us, we're not going to consider the second part of the project if we just sort of split it into two until we're satisfied that you've met all the criteria for the first. Now, some of the mitigation may get bundled in from the second half into what you're going to do in the first half, but we understand and we just want what our point here is we want the first part taken care of no matter what. Yep. And then the second part is going to be contingent upon the first part happening. That's fine. That's fine. And I, I, I believe if we issue one permit with all those conditions, then we'll be fine. So, okay, uh, that's fine. I understand. I'll make them aware of it. So, um, Andrea, do you guys have a preference for erosion control signage? Andrea, you got any comments about erosion control? And do you have any examples for me? Yeah, I can give you details. Thank you. Usually, um, uh, if you expect to be on the site for more than six months, then use a use the the um, biodegradable silt cover with the silt, you know, compost filled silt sock. Yeah, the mulch sock. Yeah, you can. Um, it's a very you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of erosion problems here no. Um, no. going out to the back. So, but there'll there'll be a lot of work there. So I, it's going to really, be a long. Yeah, that's I want to get I, that nailed down. And the signage, you got an example of your signage, conservation signage? It's it's just those just those words, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can go to one of your local, go to one of your local um design uh signs that signs Yeah, that's that fine. I got you can probably paper. laminate a piece of paper. No, let's not go that far. Okay. <laughs> let's have some plastic signs made. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, just before we uh, we head out here, any other comments, Andrea or anybody else? So one, one more thing I wanted to add was the septic system uh, being close within pro close proximity of the new potential pool. Mm -hmm. um, is there any potential that, how, how new is that system? I don't know. The house was sold in 2016, so it was checked then, but I don't know. All right. I'll, we, we'll, get a, we'll get a copy of the map. Yeah, it might be good just to see what the potential would be if, if you had to maximize that system out because of whatever soil subgrade, kind of like similar to what we looked at previously on this meeting, you know, any sort of worst case scenario where this mm -hmm. set system needs to be built to the maximum extent, whether it's going to impact, you know, and you're going to be limited based on, you know, the pool, new pool that you're proposing here. We don't want that to be a deciding factor. That's fine. We'll get, we'll get the maps for that. Let's now take a look at them. Um, any uh, public comment for 34 Roundtable? Um, so I, I don't uh, don't see any. So um, we will uh, continue. When, when do you want to continue to uh, Ken? Let's let's shoot for the twenty second. Okay, so um, make a motion to continue thirty four roundtable to February twenty second. Me a little second. Uh, roll call vote. Call fells aye. Me a little aye. Media aye. Thomas aye. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant night. Thank you. Bye bye. Amanda okay. is here for uh, 166 Massapug. 
Okay, so uh, next up is a certificate of compliance for a partial certificate of compliance for 166 Massapog, uh, which was a septic uh, repair. Um, I think only a few months ago we issued that permit. So. Yes, it was uh, September of 2020. I can bring it up. Amanda, are you with us? I am. Good evening. Do you have the plan or would you like us to put it up? Um, if you could put it up, that would be preferable. Here we go. Oh, fantastic. So this is the as built for the septic system that was approved um, back in, I want to say, October. Um, it has been installed. It has been seeded and loamed uh, twice, actually. Um, the debris behind the fence line that has been all removed and disposed of offsite. Um, everything has been done in conformance with the order of conditions that was issued. Uh, the wetland markers were installed. The only thing that uh, that has not taken place so far is the establishment of grass. So that's why we are asking for a partial certificate of compliance today. The, and that erosion control barrier is still in place and doing its job. Yep. The house has passed um, hands and owners. So I, I think they sort of kind of just need it for their logistics for the sale. Yep. I did have an opportunity to meet with the new landowner and went through um, the wetland resources uh, behind his property, the certified vernal pool, the Canoe River ACEC, um, and um, where he won't be dumping any uh, landscape debris in the future. Very good. The only uh, perpetual condition, it is, a, it is a partial, but the perpetual condition is no dumping, which is uh, number 38. Okay. Yeah, so I, I was out at the site on Sunday and had the same conversation with the same homeowner, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I had it a couple times with him as well. So he, he, was, he, was, he was understanding and, and I, did, I did direct him to Andrea if he had questions, sorry, Andrea, so. Yeah, he, I, I think he's under. I think he's under the misconception that because it's um, organic debris that it's okay. Yeah, I, I had a little bit of a conversation about that with him and understanding that that's all wildlife habitat. So good. Um, well, third time's a charm. Right. We can only we can only be consistent. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I don't have any questions. Uh, I, I did confirm that all the material was uh, removed beyond the fence uh, when I was there. So anybody have any questions? Any, uh, any public comment on 166 Massapog? Okay, uh, seeing none, I uh, make a motion to issue a partial certificate of compliance for 166 Massapog. Uh, noting perpetual condition uh, number 13 and that the complete uh, certificate of compliance uh, should be requested after the uh, landscape is stabilized uh, with vegetation. 80 seconds. Did you have a question? Nope. Okay. Uh, so, Spady, a second roll call vote. Call tells aye. Milo, aye. Spady, aye. Thomas, aye. Very good. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. You too, Amanda. Okay, so uh, next up is uh, a discussion about uh, the request for proposal for uh, 108 Canton Street. We're just going to bring in Rory O'Dwyer. And uh, Tufts Farm is here too. Okay. Shop, uh, stop uh, sharing screen. Yeah, I can do that.
So uh, just to um, introduce everybody, um, Rory O'Dwyer is the vice chair of the Agricultural Commission uh, in town. And uh, she is here to provide us some um, feedback um, and assistance. And uh, we've actually asked uh, the AgCom to give us some assistance on um, the RFP here to, for at least from an agricultural and farming perspective, that's a little about outside of our um, expertise area. So um, I've asked Rory to do that. And this is probably the first and last time you'll ever see two Rory's in the same meeting at the same time. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> so. And um, Mike Luke is with us as well. Um, there are, I, I put on my screen, if you can see it, um, uh, the existing conditions of um, the Tufts farm from the master plan that we commissioned at um, very short dollars in 2019. Um, we had uh, the students of the Conway School from uh, out in the Berkshires come out and give us an evaluation. So on the screen here, you can see that uh, Canton Street uh, running up to Stoughton, um, the Rod and Gun Club, our northern neighbor, the house, small uh, colonial, small cape, that's actually um, is got some historic uh, significance to it. A little shed, this is, he calls this the egg shed that um, he built in the last 10 years. The, um, it's a 10 year, by, by, special, by special act, uh, the Conservation Commission owns this land and has, has the ability to lease it, actually has the requirement to keep it as um, somebody living in the house in order to be a farm steward for the property to keep up the agricultural nature of this site. Um, the three acres is most of the clearing through, through here. This is the majestic um, white oak that we were using as a logo during the public process. This is where the dog kennel was until our DPW crews uh, took better care of it. The barn is still in place. The woodshed is still in place. There's some small outbuildings here. Um, and then all of this has been cleared um, by um, Mike through his 10 year lease to sort of op to open it back up into the fields. This uh, purple line does exist through the uh, driveway of going around the active barn and then into the woods and gets into this line here is flyaway pond conservation trails and you can access flyaway pond conservation trails through this property. Um, there's a little bit, this is a view of equipment storage um, that is going on on the property. And then this is the view that he opened up um, across looking, looking from the house down looking from the house down this, this sight line here. It's all, and Quisit Brook, our own Quisit Brook is the edge of the property over here. So after doing a whole bunch of evaluations of what works and what doesn't work um, and speaking to the public, getting some good, oops, I passed it, getting some good input, we ended up with a um, alternative design, which um, Charlie came to on his own um, as being the best design. There's the white oak at front and center as a significant. The, the farm stand, instead of being adjacent to the private drive, gets moved and we create off the curve and we create a gravel parking area and we and a a public pedestrian loop around paddock areas that connects back into this path that will both allow him to get into um, areas that have been used for, um, for grazing in the back, but also for us to get back to Flyaway Pond. 
We looked at other alternatives, but this creates a nice private area for the residents and the working farm. Um, here's, you know, his own, his own um, types of gardens and there's the two buildings remain and a little bit more shelter. Um, this is creating berry bushes, planting berry bushes and an orchard, recreating an orchard um, and then raised beds for produce that would all, all this activity would go into the farm stand um, so that's the proposal of what we are trying to get to. What we are sitting on today is that the lease is entered its 10 years and we need to go back out for public comment. Um, we need to go out back for public request for proposals. Um, what was what in the first 10 year period was really the best tenant uh, to actively be using the property. And he was expected to rehabilitate, reuse and maintain the structures on the ground. I contend that he probably did indeed do that. Um, the town took, took the action of replacing a culvert that was here and had been, um, it, it was really blocking the stream. Um, he helped with that activity so that it was a lot less expensive for us. A three bay equipment shed was removed and the dog panel was removed in our recent tenure. Um, the tenant has been active in doing repairs on the structures. Um, most of it has been done through the, the commission giving him reimbursement of material taken out of the rental income. He's installed four small sheds, which I assume remain private. His, if, if they don't, um, if, if he doesn't, isn't the tenant, um, he's repaired activity in on the inside the house. He regularly takes care of the oil burner. He's replaced gutters on the residence. He re-roofed the milk shed. Um, and, and as I said, he cleared the vegetation and installed uh, the paddock fencing. Repairs still needed. The exterior of the house has not been painted in the 10 years and it was anticipated at the beginning of the lease process that that was something the Conservation Commission would take care of. The electrical wiring um, is the bane of my existence. Um, it is um, needs to be done and is too expensive for it to be taken out of rents. We need an actual electrician. And through the conservation uh, community preservation, we do have a, um, a project to actually have an engineer builder give us an evaluation of the needed improvements of those buildings that are left so that we we take care of what maintenance we can but get ready for the big stuff. So um, I'm personally a big fan of the master plan. Um, it was publicly vetted. It was 2019. It spoke of increasing public opportunities to access the property, to make people realize that it actually is there. Um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a farm on town property. Um, and so more public access is uh, encouraged um, and yet still increases the productivity of the front fields and strengthens public access to get a new point into Flyaway Pond. And Im important, maintains the privacy um, of an active farm so that we don't put people in harm's way um, and we don't put them in their backyard either. But what we need to discuss is going out to this lease, which we hope to go out very soon um, because, it, because we've already overrun the original 10 year lease. Um, we hope to take, take a look at what goals you want to achieve through the lease. This is now the second 10 year period. Um, so think up, we, we should think about what we want to achieve, um, how, the, how you want the potential lessee to achieve those goals. The RFP has to have evaluation criteria. It has to identify what will be considered a successful proposal. And you need to put a team together um, your own choice of how many people are on the team um, 
to review proposals and make a recommendation. The recommendations go to our chief procurement officer, otherwise known as town administrator, Connor Reed, but the lease is actually by, by legislation, the lease is actually held by conservation commission. So Connor's gonna be a, a, a big asset to make sure we don't do anything financially silly, um, but you'll be probably signing the lease in the end. Um, the process, the process looking through everything that needs to be done, um, we do have to schedule an open house and uh, during the 30 day public comment period, I anticipate this is probably gonna take through um, mid April. If we, were, if, we if we start the process tonight and we complete and come to vote at your meeting February 8th and go immediately out to um, public comment, I mean, and you know, go to notice immediately, like the next day, um, then it'll probably take till mid-April. So that's what I'd like to talk about. Um, and what I did was I pulled together the, the goals that were, the town council's already been involved with us. Um, he, he drafted the um, RFP that you saw and, um, these are, the, these are the goals that are in the 2010 um, project. The question is, do you want to expand upon them or modify them? Um, to my own thinking, ongoing restoration and maintenance of the structures and the productive use of the land in a way that benefits the tenant, the commissioner, and the town and the general public, and then the protection of the rural character and the setting within the surrounding properties. To me, that is bare minimum achieved in the first 10, year, in the first 10 years. Do you wanna go farther um, is, is my question to you. Do you wanna say, implement the design of the, um, implement the design of the, of the uh, Conway School to the best of the abilities and ask, ask how they might be able to do that in the next 10 years. So can we just pause here for a minute and, and sort of talk about that? So was, was anybody else, the only person who would have been on the commission at the time of the Conway School would have been Mike. Mike, were, were you on that or did that happen just before you started? I think it was right before me because it does not, does not ring any kind of bell. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, so, so um, I, I, you know, like uh, Andrea, you know, I, I have a special affinity for the Conway um, design, Conway School design, um, partly because of the work that was built behind it. Um, I, I, you know, in, in an ideal world, um, I'd say over the next five to 10 year period, we implement this. I, I say that in an ideal, ideal world because I believe that may be a little bit overly ambitious. And, um, and, and I'm not quite sure, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't put in the RFP that, that um, some diligent pursuit of implementation of um, you know, portions of the, of the Conway School design master plan for Tufts Farm. I mean, we want this, I believe this is a, a continuation of the improvement of this property um, for um, both, um, farm use, um, agricultural use uh, with the installation of orchards and, um, and some of the, the um, other berry bushes and whatnot that's being installed in this front portion that is actually matching the soil samples that have been taken in that portion. Um, that can't actually be, it's, it's not good farmland, it's actually only good for orchards at this point. Um, so um, at least according to the soil reports that, that Connolly presented to us. So um, I, I think that I'd like to see that. Um, I'd like that 300 year old white oak to become a symbol of, uh, of the conservation um, efforts in this town, just like the old clock farm uh, tree used to be over on Stonehill's property. Um, so I think this can be that new symbol for uh, um, you know, conservation and preservation uh, of the, the, um, the natural um, resources that we have. Um, I mean, you don't see too many 300 year old white oaks sitting in, you know, in town. So, um, so I, I like that being the centerpiece of that. Now I'm just giving you 
that's a best case scenario. Um, I, I do also think, I do like the fact that it links up to the flyaway pond conservation area, which we've put a tremendous amount of work in in the last three years with trail creation and trail restoration that we've, has been done up in that property. I mean, if we can connect it to that area as well, as well as give the, the public parking access to get onto that, um, th that would be an interesting uh, concept of, of this as well. Now, I'm talking as a conservation commission member and I, I sort of talked about um, the things that, that are, are sort of in our charge. Um, you know, I've asked, uh, you know, Rory to come and, and give us the perspective of um, what's feasible from a, uh, from an agricultural standpoint, whether it be from the orchard portion of it or the continued uh, use of the farmland, especially in the West Field. Um, so. Hi, thanks Rory. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so first, thanks for inviting me and um, really this is a great project. Uh, the Conway design is really interesting. As you said, Rory, it is pretty ambitious. Um, I'm not quite sure from the way that the plan is written, if the Conway School envisions that a, a farmer would have a self-supporting agricultural operation on this property, or if this is a nonprofit that's gonna be soliciting donations. Um, Residential you know, use is anticipated. Okay, so how much of the cost of installation, um, the gravel, putting the gravel paths in, doing the paddock work, would be borne by the town and or the conservation commission and how much would be borne by a, a tenant? So I, I think the intention was uh, that that was uh, going to be a project that the town would have to um, um, do. Andrea, correct okay. me if I'm, I mean, that was, that was my understanding of the intention. Yes, um, it's been working pretty well over the last 10 years. Um, the, the best work that's gotten done on Tufts Farm has been when um, the labor is volunteered by the tenant and we pick up materials. So in speaking to the orchard, we would buy, we would, we would buy the saplings, but um, the tenant would, would nurture them to keep them, to keep them alive. Got it. Um, okay. But, uh, but I think we had, I think we had discussed, you know, you know, as far as like uh, putting in the parking area and um, in some of the pathways and stuff, that would be something we'd have to work out how to get the machinery and the materials so that that can be done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, this is a, definitely an ambitious project, um, but an interesting one for sure. Um, I am not a, a an apple farmer. I don't have a lot of experience with orchards, so I can't speak to the um, the safety of growing apple trees or any other kind of orchard in soils with lead levels that high, because that is a a high level of lead for the farming that I would do, which is like small fruit and vegetables. Um, so that's not really feasible for that front old orchard um, area, but the soil test for the west field and the pasture that's like around the oak tree looks like it's fine for just regular row crop agriculture. Did you call it low? What oh, row crop? Row, row crop. crop agriculture? Row crop, okay. Mm -hmm. Like vegetables, fruit, flowers, that kind of stuff. Okay, well, that's good information. Um, so I, I think from a, a goal standpoint is that um, I, I think that we should, um, we should include some aspect of, um, uh, you know, you know, initiate, um, participate. I, I'm just, you know, I, I want to partner in on this um, as far as is, is concerned, um, as far as um, implementing the, you know, at least starting to implement the Conway plan. You know, we, and we may find as we start to implement the Conway plan that some of it becomes not feasible as, you know, as, as Rory says, maybe, maybe we need to have a little bit more detail upon um, um, what, what um, what kind of fruit would be suitable in that orchard? Um, I I I know less than Rory, and she doesn't know anything about it. So you know, so she knows more. So um, I think there's I think there's other options of crops that could go in that front orchard. Like you could do any kind of decorative 
or ornamental, like you could do Christmas trees, you could do carving pumpkins, you could do cutting flowers. There's a lot of other options there. Um, I would just stay away from vegetables and small fruit because I know yeah. that that lead level is too high for those. Yeah, I, I think they definitely, um, the, the, the Conway School definitely, you know, advise us to stay away from that. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that, that from, from that standpoint, from a goal standpoint, I, I, you know, I think that, that we, sh we don't necessarily have to say which portions of the, the plan that we implement, but, you know, I, I certainly think that, that my, my thought process would be to work from the street out, <laughs> um, you know, start with the parking area, start with maybe creating some of the pathways, um, and then start on, 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 you know, start thinking about what belongs in each one of those areas, whether it be orchards or paddocks or, you know, maybe some additional um, row farming that um, might be applicable in those areas. Um, you know, I certainly think that, you know, whatever tenant we get in there, we do want to partner in implementation of uh, the Conway plan. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen in five years. It doesn't mean that all of it gets implemented. It's, um, you know, because there are going to be financial constraints here. I mean, we're talking about a $100,000 uh, project, and that was two years ago. So everything goes up, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, where do we get the grants to, to do that kind of uh, um, uh, a project, so. Andrea, anything else? I think I think that the goals kind of work well. Um, it would just being more specific, being more specific toward bringing the master plan right in there. Um, but the general verbs are are all there. Ongoing restoration and maintenance, but improved agricultural use. I think is probably what I'm hearing most there. The RFP, um, the purpose of the RFP um, is pretty much stays the same. Um, I think from what, what I'm hearing is um, partner with the town. Um, and I just left it there, partner with the town to implement this agricultural use. I don't think buying, I, this is probably doesn't need to be stated here, but you know, something like that. Um, yep. to give a sense of what it means to partner. Yep. Um, uh, Rory, do you, um, should we speak to the, should we be as specific as, as types of, of um, orchard or row crops, but not others? No, I, I, I'm not, I'm not confined to any of that. I, I simply okay. want a, 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 a a continued improvement of the agricultural activity on this property. How's that? Do you know what that's, I mean? Yeah, that's just that it, it changes it. It, it. it changes it in a significant way from, from maintain to make it better. And I think that second phase, that's a really good, really good thing to do is just give us something that makes it better. Right. Um, and I work for the town. I know how hard it is to make things happen at a for, on a town property. Right. So you don't want to make any promises you can't make. Um, to the commission, the electrical work is, um, was an emergency two years ago when there was a fire in the, in the fuse box. Um, and we've had a difficult, we took care of that. It's a better fuse box, but, um, but it's the electrical work is unseen and still should be your top priority. Um, just have to figure out how to get to it. Um, yep. So criteria, I think. I think we. I think we're. Those that are speaking are. I are. I think the purpose is is fine. The criteria is what would. This is how you would. This is how you would evaluate the project. Um, Welcome. You've got mail. Oh my. AOL. Did anybody else flash back to Sleepless in Seattle? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, so these are pretty standard things. Anybody anybody that prepares a reasonable RFP should be able to uh, present something that's within the nature and reuse concept, meet the goals, demonstrate the ability and experience, demonstrate evidence 
that they have the financial resources to undertake the project. And again, it's their piece of the project. They are partnering with us, we say earlier. Um, it's a public benefit to the citizens. It's not just a private um, enclave that you have to, you have to invite the citizens in and represent the highest and best use of the property consistent with the criteria set up. The reason that's there yeah, is now. because we're gonna continue to, I assume you wanna continue to keep the rent at a reasonably low level in order to um, have, have the farmer have the ability to put the money into um, the land in a way that he might, you know, it's a 10 year lease that he may or may not get back. We can't change, we can't increase the lease to longer than 10. Right. So, so, uh, um, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's all fine. And, you know, and, you know, my, my purpose of this project is, is much about the property as it is anything else. I, I'm, you know, I, I want the, I want the property to, to continue to be, I mean, the current tenant has done a good job of improving the situation there in, in advancing the, 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 the use, establishing it, you know, back as a, as a, as a farm, um, in, in, in some shape, um, um, you know, with livestock on the property, um, as well as, as um, some of the other um, crops that he's growing and whatnot. So uh, whether it just be feed hay and, and everything else. So, I, I mean, I, I, I am, um, you know, I, I, mean, I continue to be encouraged by, by what's been done. And, and I just, I continue to want it to improve, um, you know, part, partly because I, you know, I, you know, sat through those Conway presentations and got all excited about it. So I, I sort of want that to, to, to at least happen in some way, shape or form. Um, I think that this can be a, a, a property that, um, that, you know, people bring their kids to on the weekend to, you know, see the animals or to, um, or to see the crops or to pick berries or whatever it is, or even just, even just they know it's a place to stop to get, you know, a, a d additional place in town to get um, produce. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we've, we're getting a reputation um, in the area of, of having commitment to that, um, you know, that in town. So I'd like to see that continue. Um, and, you know, I, I truly would like to, to, you know, you know, see the, the farming aspect of this be as, um, as robust as it is possible. I, I, I have no measure of what that is, um, other than I, I want it to be, um, something that um, is, you know, as representative of agricultural um, activity as, as we can get out of the, the property. So, um, you know, I, I mean, in an ideal situation, it just continues to improve and enhance the, 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 the property. I mean, that's, that's the way I think about it. I, I want to continue to see improvement and enhancement of the property it, it, using using the Conway School design as a framework. Perfect, perfect. That's the words. Okay, we'll just remember this. It's, it's at about two hour mark. You can go back and listen to that again. Okay. Two hours, two minutes. <laughs> improve in what as using All it as a things. framework? Uh, improve and enhance. The, there you go. Using the Conway. Mm -hmm. School master plan is a framework. Um, any other um, comments, Rory, that, um, of what, what that potential could be on this property? Um, I mean, looking at this property, it's a very interesting piece of property and I think you can do some interesting things here. There are certainly limitations of various kinds. Um, so Andrea, when you put out the RFP, how much of this uh, information from the Conway master plan that you're going to include in the RFP? Is it going to be the whole thing? Um, the, it'll be a hyperlink uh -huh. for people to, for people to speak to, uh, for people to go and look at and grab whatever they want in it. But okay. we should probably have, we should probably have a sentence or two of what it, of, of what it means to us. Um, and, you know, that, that, yes, we want to improve agriculture, but we're also looking to improve public access, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, 
connectivity with our with our flyaway pond so that we so that I think you need to I think you need to set the expectation that this is we want a good farmer we want a good farmer who doesn't mind people coming to to see how their tax dollars are being used. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more of sort of like the data elements of the plan like the the topo map, the shade map, the soils map, the soil tests, um, the wetlands, uh, all that information would be pretty good if you were coming to this property new and not understanding what like the, the boundaries and the biggest sense of the word are. Um, I would think that's important information that a farmer would need to put together a proposal. So could that sort of be teased out at the very least? Yes, that they should that they're looking at it not just as a not just as a vision, but but with technical data that's available to them. Yes, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can spell. I can't type. You can't type up while well, sixteen people are watching you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have any comments? With, without it, um, evaluation team. So, um, so I, I know that um, our our intention here um, certainly um, is there a reason why we can't include the entire conservation commission. Is evaluation team or is that too large? Um, it's both. I mean, you guys are very cohesive and you know work well together. But um, a subcommittee would be smaller and easier to get together off meeting schedule. Right. Um, because it's going to be once you open up the RFP. Once you open up the bids, you have to review the proposals, hold and 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 evaluate those proposals in the first two weeks. So, so could we could we um, could we do this? Um, first of all, I, I'd, I'd love to include a representative from the Agricultural Commission on this evaluation committee. Um, um, yeah. I'm happy to be on the committee. I can also extend that invitation to other members of the committee if you would like more representation. Yeah, I, I think that, um, so, so what I'm hearing from you, Andrea, is probably to try and keep it to three or four in total. Um, yeah. And so, so I, I think that that has to be uh, you and a CONCOM rep and an AGCOM rep at the very least. Do we, do we need more than that? I mean, ultimately, CONCOM is going to have to vote on it as a whole anyway, but I, I think as, as a evaluation committee, someone, you know. It's really up to the CONCOM um, whether or not you want more than, more than one. That would, I mean, certainly I'm, I don't tend to vote on these things. I just tend to have a big mouth. So I yeah. think you could definitely get, you know, three Easton members. Okay, so so you plus three others. So at least, uh, so we have one AGCOM member, one and two CONCOM members since it's our property. Now I, 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 we're gonna need somebody from AGCOM to give us, you know, is, is what somebody's proposing from a farming standpoint reasonable? You know, they're Absolutely. gonna tell us, you know, that. I mean, I, I would appreciate that, that feedback from you guys for sure. Um, so I can speak to anything that um, would involve vegetables, flowers, small fruit. Um, if you need livestock or orchard, I can reach out to other farmer friends I have, um, if that's acceptable. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, you would just be the rep for that. I mean, if you need to gather yeah. information from other people and say, well, you know, you know, Joe tells me that, you know, that's not a good proposal. Or Joe says, yeah, that's, that's feasible or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have, so, so I would propose that, that we form a subcommittee here, two CONCOM members and one, um, one AGCOM member, um, 
to be determined? Do we need to make that decision right now? I, partly I mean, if you guys need, I mean, I have care about there. <laughs> I said I would. I would love to be on it. I mean, I, I hike past that every single morning. So, okay, I well, Mike, you. I can assure you, you are now on it. Okay, <laughs> Boom, that was easy. <laughs> you get to say it, Mike. There you go. I was thinking. I was thinking there wasn't a second member that was going to talk. <laughs> No, that's I, I. I wish I could take the farm if I had honestly the ability, and I would. I look at it every day and think that. Let me tell you. So. <laughs> um. So I, I think that that's the proposal here. So, uh, you know, Rory, I, I think that one other thing just before we 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 finalize the RFP, I, I know that we were um, requesting that um, you um, try and have a discussion you know, at your next meeting, and hopefully you can have one before um, before our next meeting, which is February 8th, um, and just give us any additional feedback that might be pertinent to what we want to achieve here. So. Um, um, yeah, Andrea, I can, can I talk to you about that tomorrow, see if we can get in a quick meeting of the AgCon before the 8th? Yes, one of your members is available on February 3rd, Wednesday Great. the 3rd. I think that works for me too. But yeah, give me a call tomorrow, anytime that you're available. You've got my cell okay. phone. Yep. Okay. I, I think that's the, the end of the, the discussion, at least for now. One, one new piece. Okay. Get your little voting hats on. Um, I said that this lease, the current lease is going to be up in February. We want to, um, we've spoken, Ben Taylor's in here. I'm going to stop sharing because Ben Taylor is our... Um, town council. Yeah, he's got his head, hand raised too. And he's been promoted to panelist Ben Taylor in the flesh because virtual is all we can do these days. Okay, Ben. Hi hey guys, um, hope you can hear me. Um, sorry for the late addition here. Um, I just would recommend at this time that um, we put the lease discussion on hold. Um, happy to discuss that, uh, Andrew, with you tomorrow. Um, I just, you know, okay. Uh, continue that on until later. Okay. So, um, what I, we won't be discussing tonight is that the uh, existing lease is up in February, and we had a, we conceptually wanted to have a, a placeholder, a legal placeholder. Um, in place until um, the lease, until until we get the RFP resolved and we know who the, and we can award this. So um, it, it it's hopefully will be one page after Ben tells me what he needs to tell me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just was reviewing the draft and there's a few other things I'd like to potentially work out before we present it to you guys. Cause you're right, Ben, I was going for a vote. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry. That's okay. It's okay. That's what we do here. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, Thank you. I appreciate okay. it, Ben. Thanks for the, uh, the the heads up there. So. Okay then. So, um, Andrew, you have enough for us on the RFP now. Rory, you have any questions for us? Yep. I'm all set. Okay. Great. Thank and you. And so, much. Um, spending time we'll get us. AgCom. If it, it, it sounds like we'll get some AgCom input on um, maybe next week so that when we come in on the 8th, it'll be with, it'll be with, with some new language. Um, we can discuss and finalize. Great, awesome. Thank you very much. Sounds good. All right, take care guys. See ya. Take care. Okay then. Um, I think that's it. You're gonna, you can uh, demote Ben and and uh, and Mike. Um. So, uh, next is meeting minutes for. Uh, I think it was December. Twenty first. December twenty first. Uh, anybody have any comments on the minutes? For those of you that read them, it is, um, it's got the annual work plan priority ideas. 
Yeah, now now I know why you were talking to me about that the other day. Because it came up in the in the minutes. <laughs> uh so any comments uh i make a motion to accept the minutes for december 21st it's 80 second uh roll call vote call fells aye and a aye spady aye i have to abstain from this one right no you can have read the minutes but I mean, because I wasn't pre was that the one I wasn't present at? Yes. Yeah, so I can't, I have to abstain. Okay, so uh, three, zero, and an abstention. So um, we're all set. So um, environmental planner updates, Andrea? Um, not really. <laughs> Um, there is a uh, just one issue that um, I'm finalizing the the uh, trail uh, grant for for Paquanicut management area with our Eagle Scout. Chris Patrick brought uh, uh, is ready to give a status update on his work on doing boardwalks and flyaway pond. As you recall, mm. um, it was approved for $6,500 to do all the boardwalks necessary and then COVID hit and then the price of lumber went Crazy. through the roof and he can't get the work done at the agreed upon price. So if, uh, if you'd like to have him come in the next meeting to prioritize what does get done, um, he has done some boardwalks. Mike, you can probably speak to that. Yeah. By the, by the old flyaway pond dam are in place um, and he has another $500 uh, to work with, but he also um, wants to talk about prioritizing what gets done and well, how, I, how it gets done with what kind of dollars. I kind of want to add to that if, if we got a second. Um, so I, I kind of know that was going on. I've been thinking a lot about that. And again, that's my backyard in there literally every single day. Um, you know, now the, 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 the trail closer towards my end and Chickie Lane is becoming extremely muddy and just because we haven't gotten the time to get out there with the bridges and get that done but why don't we instead of spending all this money on lumber you know do what they're they're doing in vermont and new hampshire and all these other trail systems just building sustainable trails taking that the fallen timber that's out there and laying that down and that handles our issue i mean right now these trails are getting so eroded because you know bikers are riding through the center of the mud and then you have walkers riding you know walking to the left and the right now the trail's getting wider and it's just it's touchy, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not great. And, and, I, and I'm seeing now just more erosion every single day and it's, and no one's really respecting it. So, I, I mean, if, if a free fix is, you know, I can be out there doing this or someone can go out there with me or whoever and just get this timber that's already down or halfway down, get it on there and, and there's your bridge. I mean, that's the, 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 I think it's also a nicer way of doing it. It's a sustainable way of doing it. Having pressure treated wood out there, is that really great? Eh. Um, I'm going to be speaking with um, Chris Patrick tomorrow at three, okay. along with the um, along with the Eagle Scout. Can I invite you to a Zoom session? You sure can. Okay. Perfect. I was just going to suggest that uh, he and Chris get together and. Yeah, I think um, because Mike has Mike has unfortunately also identified himself as a guy that wants to help the Eagle Scout. I think he's like going to be perfect tomorrow. Yeah. And, and if you think too, he's paying all this, this poor Eagle Scout has to fund all this money for all this wood. Well, it's all out there. Let's just clean up the forest. Let's do good forestry and make it look killer. I think, I think we'd get more credibility and respect if we were out there doing it that way than building these bridges that are crazy long and expensive. <laughs> it's possible yeah. that it's the uh, mountain bike um, accessibility that's going to cause the problem. But um, I bet that there's ways that one through. There, I mean, I'm telling you, there's plenty of trails up north that I ride consistently that have bridges just like how I want to do them, yeah. and uh, it's easy. We can figure it out. I like it. Sounds great. Okay, and then in the meantime, after after Chris and Mike um, solve the problems of the trails, um, <laughs> they can come in on, he, I'll ask if he can come in on the 8th. He had cool. another proposal for Wheaton Farm um, that isn't a forestry project or a wetland restoration project. Um, and so we want to bring that idea forward too. Okay. Cool. All right. Okay, that's it.
for me. Okay. Um, and I have uh, nothing to add. So any other uh, comments from the commission? Something we need to talk about? Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Malo second. <laughs> uh, roll call roll call vote. Call fells aye. Malo aye. Spady aye. Thomas aye. Thanks, John. You're welcome. <laughs> be, be well, everyone. Later, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.